This is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world. And while she looks so sad in photographs, I absolutely love her when she smiles. Hey everyone, today's guest is John Hampson, rhythm guitarist and lead vocalist for the Long Island, New York rock band Nine Days. Together, we break down the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the breakout smash hit single, Absolutely, Story of a Girl, taken from their album from the year 2000, titled The Madding Crowd. John couldn't have been more down-to-earth and fun to talk to. He mentioned that the initial lyrics to the song flowed out of him in like 20 minutes, which had him racing to find a guitar to search for the chords to accompany the melodies already swirling in his head. He said the song was written about his then-girlfriend at the time, the same girlfriend that John now calls his wife, all these years later. The easy part was writing the song. The hard part came when everyone else got involved, from management to label executives. John rose to the occasion each time, though, going so far as to play the guitar solo in a pinch at the very last minute. And John had high praise for producer Nick Dedia, who took this poppy love song and gave it a sonic kick in the tail. Oh, and the song has legs. Just last year, it was featured in the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Pretty cool. So for all this and a whole lot more, stick around. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. John, how's it going? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for sitting in. And I think, I don't think, I know that you are the first, uh, are you a high school teacher? (laughs) I am, yes. Yes, you're the first high school teacher uh, slash rock star we've had on the show. So you're you're like a Clark Kent Superman, a mild mannered uh, teacher by day right. and a rock star at night. And I got a kick out of this because you know I research uh, these songs pretty well. I, I mm-hmm. go all over the place, and I was I was on YouTube looking at the uh, comments, and yeah. you know Chris, my producer, in my notes he had put you know your your a teacher you had at some point went back to school got your degree started a family yep. and i'd kind of forgotten about it and i'm going through these comments like he's my teacher he's so cool i can't <laughs> believe he's in this video that's so awesome man it is uh it's interesting it's cool and it's funny i i probably used to well, not probably i i used to bring the guitar in more often um, uh-huh. and play and uh after a while i i just started i used to say to the students i'm like guys the world does not need any more videos of me playing story of a girl <laughs> on my desk so let's just keep them to yourself so <laughs> but yeah there's too many that is awesome well you guys were formed in 94 uh in long island and you released three independent albums in the 90s before your uh, mainstream debut album the matting crowd uh which was released in 2000 on epic records uh, the single that we're going to talk about today, Absolutely, Story of a Girl, was released on March 21st, 2000. It preceded the album by almost two months. Mm-hmm. The album came out on May 16th of that year, and it was produced by Nick Didia, uh, who, did I pronounce it right? Didia? Didia? Yeah, that's it, Didia. Yep, you got it. Didia. He's uh, worked with many artists, including, he's kind of all over the place. I love this guy's uh, resume. Bruce Springsteen, Rage Against the Machine, Anti-Flag, Ben Folds 5, Alice Cooper, Gaslight, Anthem, King's X, Mastodon. Uh, we've got a bunch of uh, Krista Makes a Podcast alumni in there, but yeah. uh, well round, well rounded producer. How'd you hook up with Nick? Um, so yeah, and by the way, you left out Pearl Jam. I did leave out Pearl Jam. Yeah. They're on here. You got to put them <laughs> on there. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a good. It's a, listen, I got to just start off by saying, like, I was, I've listened to all, I binged your podcast. Oh man, uh, and it is freaking awesome. I got, I, I have actually been excited for this all day <laughs> just oh, so thank you know you so much i was like this is it man this is like really just digging into songs and production and songwriting i, I you know i'm so glad that you know chris brought, brought me over to this and uh you do a great job so uh i'm a little nervous i gotta perform i gotta do well but uh i love your podcast just want to say that you can edit that, that out but you know just want to no, tell that, you that that 
that means the world to me. And you know what? Uh, however many 150 plus episodes, I still get nervous when I do these. It doesn't matter who it's with. I'm sure. I'm yeah. on pins and needles. I want to say the right things. I want to, you know, I, mostly I want to give the artist, the guest that's on here, my full respect and appreciation of what they've created. Because this has made me, and my, my audience knows this, this has made me think of songs in a whole different light. There's right. really not a song out there I can think of. Songs that I even maybe thought I hated at one time, that right. if I were to break it, if I were to break them down this way they take on a whole new meaning yeah oh yeah and and the list i mean the 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 people that have done this podcast my god it was i was just like holy cow gotta listen to this gotta listen to this <laughs> anyway it was great um and you do a great job but uh anyway now that i've buttered you up uh no i'm serious um well no i mean how, how did you hook up with nick because you know uh, there's so many producers and here yeah. you are you get signed to epic and I'm, I'm sure all these things are going through your mind because i had read that you had released a maybe or shopped a three song demo mm -hmm. and i think absolutely was on that demo is that correct yeah it was um look we're, we're like the such a, a a stereotype cliche story i mean we were turned down by every single label uh, at least once and we did put out some records on our own and um we did demos non-stop and you know we just kind of kept climbing a little higher a little better you know a little little more traction each time and um so i guess to sort of address the nick didia thing first that it's kind of an interesting story and, I, and i've never there's a few things I figured th this time around I would talk about with this song that I've literally never talked about. And oh, that's awesome. When we signed with Epic, we were actually on like a little subsidiary label of theirs called 550. And our A&R guy's name was Mio Vukovic. And if you are familiar with the Wilco story, Mio was the guy over at Reprise who was going to bring Wilco over. So, you know, Mio signed the band and we were talking about producers and this is how I remember it. I, I really was racking my brain and saying, did I get this right? But for whatever reason, we were under the impression that Brendan O'Brien was producing our album. And Nick Didia is, a, is an amazing, by the way, engineer. He engineers a lot of Brendan stuff or did. So I knew Nick was involved and I loved the sounds of the record. So I was psyched. Um, and then it was one of those things where I, I don't know if we were ever officially told, no, Nick's the producer. It was kind of like we sort of found out along the way uh, that, <laughs> oh, all right, it's Brendan's just going to give us some of his gear and we're going to go to Atlanta and we did the record. And that is in no way to say that we were disappointed. It was just like a, you know, we're, we had struggled so long and to, to get to that point, you're not going to start questioning, you know, things that, you know, it was like, okay, well, Nick's awesome. I and mean, we know that record's going to sound great. And to be honest, we had produced all of our own stuff to that point. So we, we were not like dying for a producer and, and Nick definitely, uh, helped us shape those songs, uh, but he was really responsible for helping us uh, capture the sound of the band, and he did a great job. Yeah, the the recording sounds real. Uh, yeah, that's the only yeah. way I could describe it. It doesn't. Do you, was it done to Pro Tools or was it recorded to tape? Uh, you know, so this is another one I had to really rack my brain. Nick, at the time, we did this ninety nine. It was May and June into July of ninety nine, and obviously Pro Tools was around, and I believe we tracked to tape. And then they dump that to Pro Tools. Okay. Um, okay. But we recorded live every. I mean, the music. Uh, it was hundred percent live. We tracked as a band in that big room at Tree Studios in Atlanta. Uh, everything was done like that. And then we would make a few fixes, and and then we would move on to overdubs and vocals. But all you know, drums, bass, two guitars, and keys, whenever possible, were all tracked live. I mean, you can tell. That's what I meant by it sounds real. Yeah. There's something honest about this. Chris Lord Algae killed it with the mix. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chris Chris always does. He, he yep. anything he touched, uh, you know, as long as the engineering and the sounds were there, he, he could make it sound good. But uh, you know this. This song is is now you know 23 years going on uh 23 years here yeah. and it just i've said this before so many times on the show it only sounds dated because i know when it was released right but it's it sounds great he did a great job and um another thing with the mix with this song and i, I don't know how deep you want to get into to this particular thing but chris lord algae was the third guy to mix the song 
No kidding. And, you know, Nick Didia did a mix, which sounded great. It, it kind of matched the rest of the record. It was, it was very, it was a little more raw. And then we had a guy who I'd gotten to be really good friends with, Brian Maloof, who was, I believe he was at RCA at the time. And he was an A&R guy that we were talking to for a while. And he just had a lot on his plate and, uh, you know, really couldn't sign the band. Uh, but we stayed really friendly. And Brian is an amazing uh, engineer and, and mixer. And he mixed A Story of a Girl. He mixed So Far Away. And he mixed If I Am out in L.A., then after that, Chris Lord Algae did a mix, and that was the one we went with for the single and on the album. Uh, and there's there's a good story behind that too. So, <laughs> well, let, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Don't stop. Don't stop yourself. So, listen, Nick Didi is amazing, and we we tracked that song. We tracked "Story of a Girl," and I just didn't think the snare was right. I just mm. I, I was like, the snare drum is not. It's not right. And it was became this. I wouldn't say it was a battle because Nick was just the coolest guy in the world. Like he, you know, there was no really battling with him. But I swear to God, we were in that studio for about eight weeks, and I'm pretty sure every single day of those eight weeks, he'd go, "Hey, why don't you jump in and and throw down Story of a Girl one more time?" Like singing, you know. I sang that song about four or five thousand times <laughs> to get it right. And I kept saying, it's, it's the snare. It's wrong. The vocal's not sitting right. It, 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 to me, it wasn't. You know, I was struggling right. with it. And I'm like, I don't know what it is. But he was like, this is a great take. We're, this, we're keeping this. We're keeping it. And I was like, okay. And I just kept singing it and singing it. And I was like, something, it just wasn't killing me. Uh, but everything else on the record was, was working great. And so I was a little bit kind of like, man, I know this is the single. I know this is the song. And it, I'm struggling here. I'm a terrible singer. <laughs> Every singer probably goes through that. And uh, so when Brian Maloof did the mix, uh, you know, Brian shined it up a little bit more. And I was like, okay, this, this is closer. And I, and I really liked Brian's mix a lot. And, and, and I like Nick's mix as well. And I'm not, being, I'm not playing politics. They were all good. I listened back to them recently. And I'm like, man, Nick's mix was great. But, um, yeah. but I do remember still feeling like we just didn't quite have it. And I don't remember who convinced the label to spend the extra money and have Chris Lord Algae do it, but he did. And I, I still have the CD that, that uh, Chris burned and like FedExed over to my manager. And it was December 21st of 1999, because it's dated on there. And my manager called me up and played me the mix over the phone. And I knew. I was like, that right. is it. And I was mm -hmm. so excited. I was like, that's, that's it. And I'm sure Chris layered in some, you know, little drum samples or whatever magic he did. Uh, but whatever he did... I was. I just knew over the phone. I'm like, that's what I've been waiting to hear for months, and uh, and that became the mix. I am so glad you expounded and said that, John. And I'll tell you why. Because you know, there's an old saying you've heard. Oh, we'll fix it in the mix. Right. You do not want to hear that as no. a performer <laughs> no. ever, especially as a singer. You're not going to fix it in the mix. That means that we're going to yeah. either bury you or mm -hmm. put some weird effect on you or get your bass player to sing it. We're going to do something. Right. And. You know, the fact that you got this mix back, and, and Chris is a master of that, the way, and, and, and a lot of these mixers are, it's how their EQ is, how they equalize everything and where everything sits in the mix. And like you said, whatever he did, he maybe added something on top uh, of that snare drum, another sample, another sound that uh, when you heard it back, you're like, there's my vocal. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly right. It, it worked. He's amazing. I love him. Yeah. Because you're not as bad of a singer as you say you are, because I watched a bunch of live videos of this song. So I'm thinking, well, why was Nick, your producer, making you do it over and over again? It's because he was hearing the same thing you were hearing, I guess, but he didn't realize it. Yeah, it could, you know, it could be that. It could also be that we all knew. We all knew like that was the song. So it had to be right. And I, I guess he just figured, hey, we got an hour. Go sing it another time. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a magic <laughs> line, uh, you know, and I dutifully would go in there and you know, and lay it down. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't terrible, but it was just, it was definitely like, man, this, I just thought it would be, I'd walk in, you know, you do your magic and you're done. But that song was, was on the, the, the slate every day until we were done. Yeah. And, and a lot of times it, it's songs that you don't think about. You lay it down in two seconds that become the hit. And other times you have to labor over it a little bit. Yeah. Like, like in this case, for sure. You just, you just never know. Well, the song was the lead off single from the album. It was track two on the album. The song reached number six on the Billboard Hot 100 in the U.S. and it peaked in the top 10 in Canada and New Zealand, was all over MTV. 
And something really cool. <laughs> the song's got legs because the song was featured both in audio and in dialogue in the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once that was released last year, yeah. which is up for Best Picture at the Oscars this year. And you recorded multiple alternate versions of the song for the movie. How did that come about? And congratulations, by the way. Oh, well, I mean, thank you. Uh, it, this, yeah, this is one of the coolest things I have ever been a part of. I'm a huge movie fan, film fan. And uh, so like it was literally two years ago at this point where uh, my publisher sent me an email and he was like, hey, there, you know, this is film. These directors want to use your song. And at the time, it was a little vague. There was something in there about wanting to change it up a little or cre be creative, but uh, it wasn't me that was going to do it at first. And so I, it was A24 Pictures, which I, I had seen a bunch of their films, and I knew the directors from Swiss Army Man. So I was like, okay, these guys are legit. I love this this film company. I, I'm in. Let, let's see where this goes. And then I, I just kept emailing my publisher, and I'm like, can you please nudge them again? I really, I, I love films. I'd love to be involved creatively. And uh, after a certain point, um, they said, yeah, you know, here's what we want. And they sent me two scenes. And you, have you seen the film? I have not seen the film. Oh, no, it, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to go check it out now for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a super unique, chaotic, emotional, uh, amazing. There's nothing like it. I, there's, it's impossible to really compare it to anything. So when you see it, just imagine trying to figure that out in like a little paragraph. That's all you get. Like, here's what the film's all about. And I was like, what in God's name? I don't even know how to describe it. So uh, anyway, they sent me two scenes and they asked me to rewrite basically the chorus of Story of a Girl to literally fit the scenes. Oh, wow. So it's, I mean, if I tell you the lyrics to these rewrites, it is hysterical. <laughs> I mean, one of them is a scene where... Uh, she's uh, it, the, the the premise of the film is this this woman and, and I won't, I'll be super vague about it but she's like sort of like jumping in and out of these different universes right the, I'll just say that much and in one of these universes she's a hibachi chef and she's battling some other hibachi chef who literally has a raccoon on the top of his hibachi hat <laughs> so I have to figure I have to write the lyrics so I'm like this is the story of a chef uh, sorry of a chef. Um, oh my God, I'm going to forget my own lyrics, but um, <laughs> she'll cut you with hibachi knives, you know, but I absolutely love her um, with every slice. That was sort of the little tag on there. So, I mean, it was, it was, it was funny, but it, when you, when you see it in the film, it, it makes sense and you hear it. Um, so I did two different scenes of that. They asked me for a, a 90s style power ballad version, which I also did. I re you know recorded it from scratch. Oh, that's awesome. And then the real kicker, the, the thing that really kind of blew me away was that one of the directors who wrote the, the film, the script, the whole reason I, I, this story of a girl got in there was because he had written some dialogue and he used two lines from the song. Uh, your clothes never wear as well the next day and your hair never falls in quite the same way. And, and he, he wrote them and he was like, that's, that's not me. What is that? And he couldn't figure it out. And then when he realized, oh, it's that song, he was like, I'll change him later. And years go by and he's like, I can't change him. So they wow they kind of doubled down, brought it into the film. So when I got to see it in a theater and I watched the actor deliver those lines, I was like, "This is amazing!" It was very cool. That is unreal, and and I know the answer to this. But did you ever think twenty three years ago <laughs> that that twenty three years later you would you would have another pop from a song you wrote? And that's just amazing. No, you just, you, you, I always yeah. tell people you never know. I, I live by that. You never know. I mean, that's that's. Yeah. I mean, that's like if you're a musician, you kind of have to live that way, right? I mean, you you just never know. You got to hang in there and just keep doing what you do and and hope that it comes around. And this was a truly 
unexpected thrill. Well, it was unexpected to me because, you know, it says recorded multiple alternate versions. I <laughs> had no idea what that meant. And yeah. to completely go in and write the most ridiculous words to, to your hit song had, <laughs> had to be crazy. You had that demo. One last thing before we jump into the song. You had the demo you, you had shopped to Epic. Yeah. I looked for a demo of this, this song online. It, I, I couldn't find one. Is there one for the, for the uh, song you could share with us? Yeah, I just definitely. I'll share it with you. Um, I actually love the demo. And the first label, we, we almost signed to Columbia uh, originally. And they actually wanted to just basically remix the demo. You look in the mirror, so how do you choose? Clothes never wear as well the next day. And your hair never falls in quite the same way. You never seem to run out of things to say. This is the story of a girl who tried to river and drown the whole world. And she looks so sad. When she smiles. I really do love the demo. And just to give a super quick background on it, the band came out of sort of this big bombastic late 80s, early 90s uh, sound. Uh, you know, the, I was in these other bands. And, and so with Nine Days, when it started, I was so determined to just like turn off distortion, just use like two amps and clean sounds and acoustic guitars. And, uh, you know, that I just was so sick of like big giant guitars and, uh, you know, everything just being being big. So we, we were layering in mandolins and, you know, uh, accordion and, and Hammond and, um, percussion and so the original demo of story of a girl was sort of at the tail end of that where we were just kind of getting back into some more guitar oriented stuff so the demo's a little cleaner and uh i I tell you one really cool thing about the demo when you hear it it's a totally different guitar solo and brian uh devoe the guitar player played this awesome it was like this ace freely kind of solo this this climbing up the neck bending thing and he just nailed it on the demo So uh, another good story, if you've got time to, to squeeze it in here, but... I love it. Um, I, I always have time. So did you read the Steve Gorman book, The Drummer for the Black Crows, by any chance? I did read the book. Yes, it's okay. awesome. <laughs> I love that book, by the way. Yeah, so there's a story in there about how he John... He doesn't pull Co- any punches. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah. But there's a story in that book about how, uh, and hard to handle, John Kolodner, that you know legendary A&R guy, heard, yeah. the, heard the original guitar solo and was like, that's not a hit song guitar solo. And Brendan <laughs> O'Brien, back to Brendan, recorded the solo for that song when like everything was done. They just mm-hmm. redid that solo and he, you know, and that was it. And, and it becomes this big hit. So I had no idea until I read this book only a few years ago, but going back 23 years, uh, so Brian does the same solo on the album that's on the demo. Although it, he'll admit this too, the, the album version, for whatever reason, that magic that was on the demo just didn't quite click. Uh, we even talked about flying in the demo solo. We never did it, but um, but I still loved his solo. And then Mio, our A&R guy, comes back when we're mixing, and we're going to master in New York. And, and he's like, you know, I played this for John Kolodner. And John <laughs> Kolodner said, this is a hit song, but it's not a hit song guitar solo. So I'm reading the book and I'm like, holy shit, like, this is his M.O. Yeah, this, this, <laughs> like, this is his, uh, this is his, his, his right? line. This is what he's got to do. I don't know. It, it, I blew my mind. I was like, I cannot believe this happened to somebody else. <laughs> so we're in the studio in New York now. We're supposed to be mastering and there's all this pressure to re- to do a different solo, so you know how that is. Is when somebody's like got you under the gun like that, all of a sudden you you sometimes you fall apart and you're like, I got nothing. Well, yeah, now now you're second guessing yourself. Everything like, if this isn't it. Well, what right. what is it? Right, we've been living with it for two years between the demo and the album. So you know, Brian's <laughs> in there sweating, just trying his best to come up with something brilliant, and it's just not happening. And I'm starting to get calls from my manager, like, Hey, we've got so and so, we can get over there, and I'm like. 
like, there's no way I'm pulling some random guy in here to play a guitar solo on my song. So as Brian was playing, I'm just like in my head, I'm like singing melodies. I'm just trying to find a way out of this. And I'm like, hey, Brian, just give me, you know, can I take a shot at this? And I incorporated parts of what Brian was playing and just sort of tied it together with some melodic stuff. And, and everybody was like, that's, that's great. Let's use that. And that's the solo that's actually on the album. But the, the, okay. the John Kaladner thing, just reading that in, in the book, I could not believe that it had happened twice in the same exact way. I thought it was pretty funny. That is awesome. Well, I got to tell you, you have absolutely paid your dues to have a hit single. Some people just get lucky and have (laughs) it, but man, it was one thing (laughs) after the other with this song. So hats off to you, John. The song's three minutes and 11 seconds. And hey, don't bore us. Get to the chorus. It it starts Uh, with the chorus. What, What more do you want here? Chorus one right off the top. This is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world. And while she looks so sad in photographs, I absolutely love her. When she smiles. This is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world. And while she looks so sad in photographs, I absolutely love her when she smiles. True story? Mm-hmm. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I was, I'm dating this girl at the time, and uh, I'm, I'm like in my mid-20s. And you know she's a couple years younger than I am, and she was the first girl who sat literally sat made me sit down and was kind of like, "Listen, I'm not in here just to kind of hang out and have fun. Like I- I'm I'm thinking long term. I'm looking for a ring." And you know I- I'm this mid twenties musician who's got n- no money <laughs> and trying to you know <laughs> make it as a mu- and I'm just thinking this girl's out of her mind. But um, we were dating, and and make a long story short, basically any time one of her friends would get engaged. My weekend was ruined because it wasn't her. Uh, So that happened. I was at a gig. I was actually playing with Harvey Danger. Remember those guys? Of course. Yeah. yeah. We're doing a gig with those guys. And um, somebody got engaged and she was all pissed off at me and she walked away. And uh, it sounds very cheesy, but it's, she's, you know, she walks to the other side of the venue and she's talking to a couple girlfriends and I'm watching her and kind of grinding my teeth. And I'm like, I can't stand her. And, and then as I'm thinking that, she just laughs about something and she's way on the other side of the room. And I literally think I can't, you know, I can't stand her, but I love her when she smiles. And ah. the the words just started coming and the melody, every that chorus was the first thing. That's why the song starts with it. It was the first thing that happened. I started singing that and the words just came out. It came out really fast. All the easy stuff with the song happened in the beginning. I, I mean, I wrote most of it, I mean, probably within about 20, 25 minutes, most of the song was lyrically and melodically there. And then I, I didn't even have my guitar at the time. And I went over and I, I picked up the guitar. I was like kind of like pacing around, trying not to lose that moment. And I just picked up the guitar and started trying to figure out the chords that fit under that melody. That's kind of how it happened. Yeah, there's some fun chords in this. I, I, I like uh, like what you did here. The, there's vocals on the first line with this is the, and on the last line, when she... It stops there, and it's just the vocals. And those two little spots there, that's a hook within this song every time that happens. And it happens a couple times. You know, it's, Sometimes you don't think of, of those things being hooks. It's got to be this big guitar hook, and you don't even mean to do it. But where you put those stops where it was just a vocal, it, it gets personal there. It, it, it's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, the uh, whole band comes in for four bars. I call this part, John, the post-chorus jam. Drums, bass, stereo guitars. Uh, was this a B3? Yeah. Organ? Yep. Hammond? Yep. Okay. Real Hammond. A, yep. a re- real Hammond organ in there, and I'm hearing tambourine and, I believe, shakers in here. There's definitely shakers in there. Um, I feel like they're in the second verse more so, but I'm sure we, we threw that in there, yeah. It's funny, and it's a Lord Algae trick, okay? Because I hear and I, it's somewhere else in the song where it's like, I know the tambourine's there, but you could barely hear it. In mm-hmm. other parts, it's really loud. So yeah. I kind of think it's it, it's in there maybe the whole time. But after the post-chorus jam, we're into verse one. How many days in the year? She woke up with hope, but she only found tears. And I can be so insincere. Making a promise is never for real. As long as she stands there waiting. How many days disappear when you look- 
How many days in a year? She woke up with hope, but she only found tears. And I can be so insincere, making her promises never for real. As long as she stands there waiting, wearing the holes in the soles of her shoes, how many days disappear when you look in the mirror? So how do you choose? <laughs> Sounds so formal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm reading your, your yeah, own lyrics back at you. <laughs> it, uh, it's strange. It's cool, though. Um I think it's once you know the story I think it's 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 pretty literal. You know it's it's literally me kind of I don't want to say I'm stringing her along cuz listen I I don't know if I'm ruining the surprise here but I did marry her. Uh she is Oh. She is my wife. I I I, I didn't know if you knew that. I just realized that part. I probably should have <laughs> mentioned that. that. <laughs> so we did get married. So I guess now we could talk about it and I don't have to feel like I'm a heel but you know I, I knew that we had something, but I just, you know, I wasn't ready to, to make that move. So this, the song, the, the verse, the first verse is me just saying, you know, how many days in a year, you know, she wakes up with hope thinking today's the day he's going to propose. You know, today's mm -hmm. the day we're going out to this nice restaurant or we're, we're taking this little trip and I just know. So, you know, she, she'll get ready to maybe she buys an outfit or does her hair or gets her hair done or something. And she, you know, she's in that mirror thinking today's the day. So I want to, I want to look good mm -hmm. and i know that makes maybe that makes her sound kind of uh, i don't want to say pathetic but i i don't you know it's just it's a song you know it's these were things that were happening in our relationship and um this was just all came out in that moment and i'm i'm acknowledging like i am insincere you know i am i'm saying hang in there you know it, it, and making promises uh but at the same time not really ready to deliver so that's a lyric <laughs> and yeah, there you go. No, that's great. This took an interesting twist because, you know, you were kind of painting her in a different light at first. And, and she, you know, now I realize she's your wife and <laughs> she had to go through a lot. <laughs> she did. Because when this song yeah. was written about her, it wasn't what it became. Yeah. Next thing you know, your mid 20s, the guy that you want to spend the rest of your life with, he's on TV now. Yeah. You know, you're, go you're going out to eat. He's getting recognized. And for a woman to stand by you, anybody to stand by anybody in that situation, uh, yeah. uh, that's, that, that's really great. Yeah. It was a, uh, it was a rough, it was a rough time for a couple of years. I mean, you went through it, you know, when, when things kind of blow up, uh, life, oh, yeah. life just, I mean, it is like in a way, in a way, you know, it, it is like you see in the movies, your whole life gets upended for a short while. Uh, and you got to hang in there for to, and, and come out the other side. I'm I'm glad you said that. And, and again, it's something I haven't said in however many shows we, we've done so far. But my life just isn't my band anymore, and yours right. hasn't been for a while. Yeah. And it it took me a long time to realize who I was. You know, for years I was Chris from Less Than Jake, and then you step back from it. I have kids now. I have yeah. a family, and you know, life takes on a different meaning. I love my band; it'll always be part of who I am. But there's so many other things I I, I enjoy doing. Um, don't know if I could teach English. I'd probably <laughs> put 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 a kid's head through the chalkboard, but <laughs> uh, <it's> a, <laughs> especially if you're teaching high school English. <laughs> yeah, it's it's well, it's a whole other thing. Uh, but it is the only other thing that I ever imagine doing believe it or not it, yeah. it's just one of those things where back in high school i remember my senior year i was I, I had this fantastic english teacher for college reading college prep mr kozira if he's out there and uh i just remember thinking man if i can't make it as a rock star i want to do what this guy does i he's awesome and uh so that that's how that happened well that's awesome your students love you and, and and you're living living both your dreams which is great drums bass and another guitar uh joins in here with the shakers and the tambourines for verse one and these stereo guitars here um you know a lot of times your, your stereo guitars john they're locked completely they're completely exactly the same and then you have bands like the stones and aerosmith and guns and roses where those guitars, ACDC, are really playing off one another. And that's what's happening here. The guitar panned off left is kind of doing this chicka chicka. And this guitar uh, seems a little bit more playful than the one on the right. But the two guitars really breathe like this. Yeah. It, it, it's great. Was was there attention paid to that when you did it? You didn't want them to be mirrored exactly the same? Yeah, 100%. Brian and I, Brian's the other guitar player, we never played exactly the same thing. It was always... You know, if, there, if there's going to be two guitars, there's got to be something happening between those two guitars. Uh, sometimes I would be playing something arpeggiated, or he would. Uh, so he might play a more melodic part. 
Um, but in this one, it's a little more, you know, there's a syncopation that's kind of happening between the two guitars. And uh, again, we, we we did track live and, and we wanted to keep that. We wanted to keep some, some energy, some raw energy in there. So yeah, it was totally purposeful. I'll use the word again. It sounds real. It sounds like there's a band set up and someone captured exactly how they, how they sound. It doesn't sound like uh, some studio trickery here and those guitars sound great. Pre-chorus one comes in. Your clothes never wear as well the next day and your hair never falls in quite the same way. You never seem to run out of things to say. So those lines, it's funny when I wrote them. Um, growing up on Long Island, you're you you know it's kind of like if you grow up in Jersey, you, it's Springsteen. If you grow up on Long Island, it's Billy Joel. And <laughs> I grew up listening to Billy Joel, and I, I remember getting Glass Houses for Christmas when I was a kid, and just played that album to death. And when I wrote those lines, I remember I was like, oh my god, that's the most Billy Joel thing I've ever written in my life. Uh, it just kind of came out. Uh, but it's it kind of goes back again to the idea that, you know, if she's expecting this wonderful day, right, and it doesn't happen, you know, we've all, everybody can relate to that. You know, you kind of get dressed up for something, and then when you come home later at the end of that night, as good as those clothes looked on you when you walked out of the house, you're kind of a mess when you come home, right? It, it doesn't, mm -hmm. things are just sort of, you know, wrinkly or, or your shirt's kind of half untucked or whatever it is. And that was sort of like another disappoint, the end of another disappointing day. Uh, it's just sort of painting that picture. <laughs> it almost sounds like this relationship shouldn't have worked, John, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's pan, pan out But see, that's why the kicker is I absolutely love her, you know? So at the end, <laughs> through all of this, it does come back around. Hey, everybody, don't go anywhere. We got lots more with John Hampson coming up after a few words from our sponsors. Hey, everyone, this is Tuck from Fit for a King, an off-road minivan. Every week, I bring you fun interviews alongside your favorite metalcore entertainers with my new podcast, Get Tucked. Join me every Monday with bands like Counterparts, Crystal Lake, like Moths to Flames, and many more. We play unsigned and undiscovered bands, deep dive into each artist's history, and of course provide the greatest breakdowns in current metalcore. Tune in to Get Tucked every Monday, out now through Sound Talent Media. Do you like to laugh, geek out on music, and learn all about that band or artist who had that one song back in the day, but then seemed to fall off the face of the earth? If so, you need to subscribe to One Hit Thunder. Together with an array of interesting and hilarious guests, we do a weekly dive into one-hit wonders like Eiffel 65's Blue, Krayshawn's Gucci Gucci, EMF's Unbelievable, Delamitri's Roll to Me, Los Del Rio's Macarena, Musical Youth's Pass to Duchy, and even Patrick Swayze's She's Like the Wind. So are you subscribed to One Hit Thunder or what? As Desiree would say, you gotta be. And as K7 would encourage, you gotta come baby come and join in on the fun of the One Hit Thunder podcast. And now, back to the show. Well, in pre-chorus one, drums, bass, stereo guitars, and a buried arpeggiated guitar noodle kind of panned off right. And there's a keyboard playing a lick panned off left, and the shakers are present here too. Love what that keyboard's doing mm -hmm. uh, in, in this uh, pre-chorus one. Interestingly enough, later in the song, pre-chorus two, I swear this this keyboard thing is louder. And that, again, is a Lord Algae thing. He'll mix stuff up a little bit louder, and I think that's what's going on there. For some reason, I can just hear it better the second time around, but that part is great. And then we get right in to chorus two. This is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world. And why she looks so sad. Right from pre-chorus one, we get into 
chorus number two, which is the same lyrics as the top of the song, drums, bass, stereo guitars, tambourine, and shakers. And John, if there is any keyboards here, uh, they're buried under the guitars. Do you, do you recall if there's keyboards in this chorus? You know, it's, it, I don't think there is. And it's kind of funny, and arrangement-wise, this song is, is kind of unique in that you'd imagine when you get to the chorus, the intensity and that wall of sound is going to build. Um, yes. But the harmony comes in really loud. You got that tambourine going there. And there really aren't keyboards in the chorus. I couldn't hear them. And that's, it, to, to your point, that's what made me go, wait a second, this is where the right. big, right. you know, <laughs> organ keyboard pad should come in and they're not there. Yeah. And I don't, I, honestly, I don't, I don't remember that ever being a decision. You know, I, I'm sure it was, we were, we were super meticulous in rehearsals. Like we, as a band, I mean, we were playing four or five nights a week for years. Uh, I mean, and that's every week. And then when we weren't playing at night, we were rehearsing at the studio we'd rent out. Uh, I remember every Tuesday, Thursday, we'd go from 12 to 4, and we would just work on new songs And re- as a band. And so, I mean, we were tight. And we we really kind of gave each other a hard time about parts it had to be right so for at some point we must have decided hey uh jeremy our keyboard player like just don't play in the chorus i just don't remember doing it but yeah well i don't think you need it because of what exactly what you said this is the first time that we get harmonies in the song Mm -hmm. and there's a harmony on every line here again this is the at the top you just vocals only but there is a harmony there and then when she smiles that's vocals only again much like the top of the song and then we get that post-chorus jam again for four bars after chorus two and then we get into verse two and i gotta ask was the demo lyrically or arrangement wise any different no really the it's sonically different and there i like you know what there are some the difference is that on the demo and i'm not sure why we did this but uh instead of like uh jeremy's playing like a whirly uh, a distorted whirlitzer in the verses and stuff mm-hmm. and we actually tried out like this synthesizer kind of sound on the demo but arrangement wise it's the same and the reason i ask that mostly is when we get to the fourth chorus at the very end of the mm-hmm. song it really changes up there yeah that's the only time the chorus really changes and i figured maybe that was in the studio going you know what we should we should branch out here but it's interesting to hear that that was the same thing on the demo uh verse two now how many lovers we stay just to put up a fist every day and all day How do we wind up this way? Watching the mouse for the words that we say As long as we stand here waiting Wearing the clothes of the souls that we choose How do we get there today? When we're walking too far for the price of a shoe Your clothes never wear as Now how many lovers would stay Just to put up with this every day and all day? How did we end up this way? Watching our mouse for the words that we say as long as we stand here waiting, wearing the clothes of the souls that we choose, how do we get there today when we're walking too far for the price of our shoes? Those sound pretty good. Who wrote that? Um, <laughs> very poetic. <laughs> well, I was definitely trying, that's for sure. Uh, so this is an interesting verse because I hate the word lover. And I struggled with try to what else I could put there. And I, it just worked, but I would, n- I've never called someone my lover. <laughs> I can't imagine. Mm-hmm. I know people do. I just couldn't. And you know, what gave me permission my, my, in my own head was Neil Young, uh, the song Birds. I don't know if you know this off after mm-hmm. the gold rush. And he says, lover, there will be another. One. I was like, all right, if Neil Young can use lover, <laughs> I think I'm okay. Lover, there will be another one Who'll hover over you beneath the sun um, But I, I, that was a rough one for me. Um, and also, it's funny, the lyric sheet that you have is, is the, uh, the single lyric. The, the actual lyric is just to put up with this shit day after day. And there was just another trick I fell for where during the mix, Epic was like, hey, can you just give us a clean version for, you know, like uh, commercials or whatever? Because I always thought they just bleep that word out or, or duck it. You know, I thought that th- that's what they would do. They used to do that a lot. with they- Right. So, and, and that's what I would have preferred, to be honest, was just kind of duck that word. But they, I came up with that as an alternate line, and that's the one that went out there. But it's not a big deal. But, um, you know, it, it's it's... 
again, it's like watching our mouths for the words, just being careful, you know, like when you're in a relationship, you, you know, you want to be respectful, but maybe you don't want to start feeling like you have to watch everything you say, that that's not a great place to be. And then, you know, again, in, this, in the first verse, I talk about soles of shoes, and now it's the wearing the clothes of the souls that we choose. So it's definitely playing on that word soul. Um, and just sort of like, you know, who who am I? You know, the, this, these clothes I'm wearing is, is like, I'm, I'm this musician, this is my life, this is what I'm choosing, and I have to sort of answer to that, and I, I have to honor that and still honor her and try to figure out how to make everything work. So that's where walking too far for the price of our shoes, it's kind of like, are we built to last? You know, is it, can, can we, can we kind of get through this? And you know, the thing I guess to remember too, as I'm writing this, this is really, it's not stream of consciousness at all, but but it's real, it's real of the moment. That's what I was feeling at that particular moment. I didn't labor too much over these uh, other than that word lover. <laughs> um, the words just kind of came pretty fast. So uh, yeah. it, it is capturing a moment for sure. I love what you said about the label saying, hey, just just for commercials, just redo this line. Yep. Because I'll tell you something, if you ever had that happen to you again, you'd know exactly what they were doing. Because I had that happen once. Yep. And once it happened, <laughs> I talked about this recently on... <laughs> On the show, I can't remember with who, but the, you have that happen once, and yeah. you have what happened to you happen. It'll never happen again. No, you learn. <laughs> you learn too late, but you learn. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, interesting. Verse two here. There's a harmony on pretty much everything here. Yeah. You get out of that chorus, and it and it, and it just keeps going, uh, except for the line right in the middle. As long as we stand here waiting, the lead vocals go up a register. There, it's got some hair on that line. Yeah, a little, for sure. A little angst on that one. The shakers are here. This is the part where I think the tambourine's there, but it's really buried. Drums, bass, stereo guitars are in, and a guitar panned off left and a guitar panned off right. Uh, both of these are doing this staccato rigid type lick. Mm -hmm. and it just really makes the verse move here. And there's a cool keyboard part panned off left that sounds like something out of a space movie. <laughs> that sound is really cool. Whatever, I don't know what that is. It's, it's, re it, it's a really cool sound, though. Yeah, that's a that's a whirly through. I'm sure you know Brendan O'Brien. We use a lot of his equipment, and he has such amazing vintage amps and guitars and uh, Wurlitzers, Hammond, everything. So that was a whirly through some sort of old amp, tube amp that we just kind of uh, distorted out a bit. Uh, and I love that part. It's a really, I, I was trying to think if I've ever heard it. I'm, I'm putting it up against like funk records, disco records, like things like that would have keyboards, rock records. I, I can't think of another sound like it. It's really unique. That's cool. Um, yeah, it's, it, you know, it's just part of what we did for so long. I, to me, it, we, we used that sound, maybe not exact, but that idea of a sound we, we used a, a quite a bit. So, uh, you know, that distorted whirlies on a, a bunch of other songs on the album. And, and the guitars you were talking about, that's one thing that's different on the demo. The, the second verse, I, I always wanted it to be like, uh, and I'm trying to, I think this was a Nick Dia word, but it should be an event is what I think what he used to call these things. So on the original demo, instead of doubling the, the bigger chunky guitars, one dropped out completely. And that like staccato thing took its place along with a shaker and stuff. And I just wanted that second verse to be differentiated from the first verse to have a sonically, like all of a sudden a, a different sonic palette there. Uh, and, and when we did it with Nick, you know, he, the song definitely got amped up in general. So to take it down that far didn't work. So we kept, you know, the two guitars in and just sort of layered that on top. No, it, it's awesome, and it totally differentiates those parts. I mean, it yeah. it still uh, has the essence. It sounds like verse one, but it's completely different because of the instrumentation. I really love it. I also love that all the harmonies in verse two here are all the higher harmony to your lead vocal, except for the line, wearing the clothes or the souls that we choose. There's a great lower harmony on that one line only. Mm -hmm. It's great. Wearing the clothes of the souls that we choose How do we get there today? 
Yeah, it's a, it drops down yes. an octave. Instead of singing the higher harmony, it's this low octave thing. I remember doing that. So funny, until you said it, I completely forgot that that was there. But yeah, that is there. Yeah, now, it was. do you recall if that was on the demo, or was that something you were playing with? In the it's really, it really stuck out to me, because the rest of it, the harmony is all higher than, the, than yeah. the melody. And there it goes lower. It was like, whoa, what is that? It, it's great. Yeah, I, you know what? I don't remember if it's on the demo. I feel like... It might have been because, again, on the demo, things were definitely cleaner. And because that second guitar dropped out, that that line might have sounded kind of naked. So maybe we did put it on the demo. I'll, I'll have to actually listen to that myself. I don't remember if that's on the demo or not. I, I feel like it... I think it is. If I had to bet, I'd say it is, but I'm not positive. If I understand here waiting, wearing the clothes of the souls I would choose, how do we get there today? Well, uh, pre-chorus two is next. The same lyrics, except for the last line. You stick in a butt there, but you never seem to run out of things to say. And was that just one of the vocal takes you did and the butt ended up have, uh, being there? Or was that on purpose? I'm sure it was on purpose. I, I definitely, as a, as a writer and arranger of songs, I'm very aware that I don't want to just keep repeating. You know, there has to be some other, some change, some other little bit bit of information or a lyric or a part that that keeps you along for the ride um and and melodically that second pre-chorus jumps up too there's it's it in, the intensity is different so i don't remember specifically with that word but it it's definitely something that i i do in general so i'm sure that was there very purposefully Right, yeah. If, if, if I'm going to stick a word like that, and it's pretty much for the same reason you laid out. I want it to be just a little bit yeah. different, but not change what, from what the meaning is. And uh, here it doesn't change because you only add it in one word. Well, we get into chorus three. This is the story of a girl. Cry a river and drown the whole world. And while she looks so sad and lonely there, I absolutely love her when she smiles. This is the... Again, the vocals are naked there. I'm calling that a, a, an awesome hook that you guys probably never even thought of as being a hook. It's great. Uh, and then on the last line, when she, uh, everything here, again, there's harmonies throughout the whole chorus. Same instrumentation as chorus two, pretty much. And then we get in to the musical bridge here of the song. What I love here at the end, when she smiles, the melody and the harmony notes change on smiles yeah. when we go when the band goes to that E minor seventh yep. uh, for this bridge part. Yeah. It's really cool, and this goes on for eight bars: drums, bass, stereo guitars, and a funky keyboard solo panned off left, and the tambourine is nice and loud. This is followed by a guitar swell and a lone tom hit with some good reverb on that. Uh, sounds really big to take us into the guitar solo for sixteen bars. The guitar solo that. John played. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when she smiles. that sit with your band member you know he, he's the guitar player and and you know i have no problems handing my guitar off you know my bass player could play something better than me and i played this lick for a half hour it's like you can play it cleaner play it right. I'll, I'll figure it out live but was that okay is that how your band works yeah i think for the most part i mean you know i i was sitting there the whole time and feeling for brian because it, it was just one of those things where you know look sometimes you catch that lightning in a bottle moment when you're under pressure but Sometimes, you know, it it just, you're so used to, he'd been playing the same guitar solo, like I said, for probably two years at that point, or at least a full year. So to suddenly switch gears while in the studio, in this really, you know, sterile environment where there's people like calling and, you know, your A&R guy's telling you it's not a hit song guitar solo, it, it, it's... You know, it, it's it's challenging to to perform under that kind of pressure, and I don't think Brian was was too upset with it. I think he was probably you know just uh, grateful that we got through it without having to bring some ringer in. 
and and the, the funny thing is uh brian's played that song live ever since the solo but we did a re-record a few years back and we had to go back and now I'm the guy who played the solo and I'm saying, no, 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 this is how I, for the first time in like 16 <laughs> years, I'm yeah. going, wait a minute, we're in the studio now. And I'm going, well, that's not what I played on the, on the album version. And he's like, this is, this is what you played. I'm like, no, it isn't. So I played what I played on the original album version and everybody was scratching their heads. Like, that's it. I'm like, yeah, I swear to God. And it was like a, a huge argument in the studio. They're like, that's not what I heard. I'm like, that's what I played. <laughs> That was pretty funny. Well, I'm glad that glad it all worked out like that. And I've had a sense of relief, John, where I've played something on a demo or played a part, and I'm convinced that's what the part is. Yeah. And then finally, you're tracking it, and and it, you almost I almost sit back and wonder, wait a second, were they were they uh, you know kind of conspiring behind my back? Because all of a sudden, it seems as everyone <laughs> in the band all at once be like, yeah, the solo's not kind of working. Right. right. Like, wait a second, <laughs> right. I've been playing this right. in rehearsal for the last two months, yeah. and then. You know, somebody else will be like, well, this is what I hear. And they'll, at that point, they can play something else because they haven't been playing the same. I, I could see where Brian was at. He was like, well, what else is it going to be? Yeah. You got John Kaladra calling, you got the AR guy, yeah. or, you know, all those things. And uh, to this day, I, I like the solo Brian played a lot. I would have been thrilled if it was on the record the way he played it. Um, but again, it was one of those things where we were not in a position to argue it. It just we we just had no choice. So you know, you, there it goes. Yeah. Well, the guitar solo is for sixteen bars. The organ is back in with the drums, uh, bass. The bass is super funky, and there's some really cool note choices here: stereo guitars, tambourine, and shakers. And this is the verse chord progression here uh, underneath the solo which sets up perfectly for pre-chorus 3 and you mentioned a moment ago John that pre-chorus 2 kind of goes up I don't know if it does pre-chorus 3 definitely goes up here on the first two lines yeah for sure Well, your clothes never wear as well the next day. There's a well in there that you don't get on the other lines. All the other lyrics are exactly the same, but uh, the melody is up on those first two lines. Uh, And then right at the end, there's a cool bass throw that happens over This Is the Story of a Girl. It's basically the reintro here, what I'm calling chorus four. It's just a hi-hat panned off left and that single guitar panned off left. The lyrics are exactly the same, except there's no when she smiles Mm -hmm. at the end. This is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world. And while she looks so sad in photographs, I absolutely love her. This is the story of a girl. It just repeats into the next part, which the lyrics here, we get a lyric change. And this is why I asked you earlier about the demo, mm-hmm. figuring maybe the chorus was just the same here. And like, oh, now, you know, you're in the studio, you're recording it for real. We have to change it. But you're saying you remember the demo being like this as well. Yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. And and this is, again, this, I, this song was very formed it, it was there and and we get to the chorus this is the fourth time you're hearing the yes. chorus because so <laughs> there is no way that i can just repeat the same thing right i mean mm-hmm. at that point you'd be like i already heard this three times i i'm turning the song off right i'm done so i i toyed with a couple of different lyrics there and i also you know it's a short chorus really if you think about it i mean i don't know how many seconds it is but it's it's pretty darn short so i knew i was gonna you know, lengthen it, double it, and it's sort of like a double and a half, I think. Um, it is, yeah. So, yeah, I definitely changed the lyric. And, and just to throw this out there, the second chorus, believe it or not, there is a change there, too. Instead of saying she looks so sad in photographs, and in, well, let's call it the third chorus, actually, I say she looks so sad and lonely there. Ah, you're so, right. I I yeah. have that written here, and I, I left that out. Yes, good, good catch, John, good catch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so then now get to fourth chorus, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to build to it and I, I go with you know she looks so sad in photographs um and then it's instead of mm, sorry of a girl cry a river and drown the whole world it's her pretty face she hid from the world this is the story of a girl the pretty face she hid from the world and while she looks so sad and lonely there I absolutely love her this is the story of a girl who cried a river and drowned the whole world and while she looks so sad So 
So I definitely was super cognizant of changing those lyrics to give you something new to to get the story one step further down and and say something else about the 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 girl in this story you know she her pretty face she hid from the world and then there's that little vocal hiccup this oh, is yeah. Oh, yeah. the story oh, yeah. of a girl yeah so that <laughs> i'll tell you right now when when i came up with that moment that is the moment where i went holy shit <laughs> This is a hit. That's the first time. I, I never thought like that. We were like, we really were, believe it or not, we were a rock band. We didn't think about radio. We didn't think about hits. But this song just came out. And I remember that moment when I came up with that, just like that little pause. And I was like, holy cow, that that is going to make everybody have to get to the end of this song. Because mm-hmm. you want to hear that moment. And that's when I felt like I, I was... I was done. You know, I felt like I I did it. The song is complete. That's really interesting. And we're we're going to get to that in one second. And a couple things here. We get that uh, last chorus. It's just like the intro, but you get no when she smiles. And the next part that you were just referencing, this is the story of a girl with a new lyric here, a pretty face she hid from the world. And while she looks so sad and lonely there, I absolutely love her. There's no when she smiles there. But on the next part, when we go back to the actual, you know, the same chorus that uh, was earlier in the tune, uh, the back half, you get when she smiles twice. That hiccup you're talking about, uh, you can't probably see in my notes here, but I wrote <laughs> vocal hiccup. That was the oh, exact, that's great. <laughs> that was the exact term that I used there. <laughs> what was it about that vocal hiccup that made you think that was a hook that people were going to want to hear that? You know, I don't know. It just, it happened. It was intuitive. And, you know, the song has has a syncopation to it. It has a, has a rhythm. Like, it, it definitely, you're moving when you hear it between the drums and the guitars and, and even the, the, the sort of meter and the rhythm of the vocal. So that just felt very natural when it happened. And, you know, I, I wasn't sitting there going, hmm, I need to do this. It just kind of happened. And but I, I, I was like, oh, my God, that's that's it. Like, that's yeah. that's the thing. Because I've done clever tricks like that before in the mm-hmm. studio. I'm like, oh, this is great. I'll put a pause there and it'll be a little right. hiccup. And everyone's looking at me going, no, stop doing <laughs> that. You know, right, right. And y- there's other times where I- I've done it by accident. And then I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, I got to redo that part. Like, why? I'm like, oh, I, I, I did a hiccup. They're like, no, that was great. That pause. Yeah. So you never right. know when those things are going to come into play. But how did the band feel about that? How did Nick feel about that? With Nick Dedia, you know, all he really wanted to change in the song was just to make it a little sonically more aggressive and rock. And he did. And and, and, it, and it was the right choice. I mean, it, it's, it came out amazing. But the arrangement was, like I said, it really, it was there. There's really no difference in in the structure of the song from almost the very, I mean, probably almost the literally the very beginning. And when I wrote the song, I I went home that night and I used to have a, I don't know if you, Tascam 388, that big quarter inch eight track. You ever seen Mm -hmm. one of those things? That's what I had. That's what I was recording demos on. And I would use a drum machine and I, I tracked the song, just the music. And I remember uh, Brian came over to pick me up to go to rehearsal or something, and I had it on a cassette, and I popped the cassette in the tape deck to just the music, and I was like, just listen to this, and I sang along in the car. And he was like, that's... I don't know if he said that was a hit, but he was like, that's a great song. And when we got to rehearsal, for the first... I never did this before... But we got to rehearsal and I and I basically showed the band the song. You know, everybody kind of came up with their thing. But here's the song. Here's the arrangement. And we played it for probably uh, two hours until the band had it nailed. I wasn't singing, though. I, I, ref- I was like, I'm not singing a word of this song until we can play it. Because I want you to hear it for the first time as a finished thing. So we, we went through it, and when, when the band could nail it from start to finish with just the music, I was like, okay, I'll sing it now. And I couldn't even look at them. <laughs> I was just kind of like, they're going to they're gonna laugh. This is so pop. This is mm-hmm. such like a, a, a cheesy pop song. And I started the song, we played the whole thing, and I remember everybody just kind of busted out laughing, like, oh my God, like, that's great. Like, this is great. And it was, it was a great feeling, but I'd never done that before, and I just kind of knew... It was something a little special about it, and uh, I wanted them to hear it for the first time, fully realized. So that was that was a fun little trick. 
Yeah, that's a, that's an awesome story. Well, the song ends with a full chorus, just as you hear it right at the top of the song, and it ends with When She Smiles twice. The first When She Smiles is harmonized, like all the rest of the lyrics here. Um, get that vocal pause on I Absolutely Love Her. There's this great snare fill that happens there. It's a really cool pocketed snare uh, before the When She Smiles lines that happened twice. On the last When She Smiles, there's no harmony, but it's sung with conviction again, like that line with no harmony on verse two, where you kind of just let loose there. It's the same kind of feeling. Uh, and the band ends with the stereo guitars and the organ. Uh, they're really noticeable on the fade out. It kind of just all, all goes away. And, you know, after all the trials and tribulations you went through with this song, when all was said and done, you got that mix back from Chris Lord Algae. That was that was the proof in the pudding right there. It, it, everything sounded uh, sounded perfect to you, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it 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 was the final piece to making that the thing that it needed to be for sure. Well, that's great. I want to thank you for sitting in. I want to thank you for going through this. And in I mean, this is a you know, this is a personal song. It's about your wife, but it, it's right. something that, uh, you know, again, you probably never in a million years thought that that's something you were just writing from the heart. Uh, that that was going to be your, your breakout hit. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it really okay for me is it was not, it wasn't planned. It wasn't formulated. I didn't sit down and say, I got to try to write a hit. Uh, it really just came from a moment of pure inspiration. And that, makes it sit a lot easier for me. You know, I, I, I think it had it been a hit that I was like, you know, didn't have any kind of real personal attachment to it might feel a little kind of uh, shallow or, or light, but this one, it feels pretty good. Well, I'm definitely going to go check out everything everywhere all at once now. I want to see uh, what what you did there. My, my curiosity has definitely peaked. And again, congratulations with all your continued success. Congratulations with being a favorite to your students. Those comments were so cool to see. They they obviously love you. And uh, what would you like to leave everybody with? What do you got coming up with uh, with the band? Anything exciting or uh, it could be about your English teaching? What do you got? <laughs> Yeah, we're reading Catcher in the Rye. Now, uh, that is exciting. <laughs> but uh, I am actually uh, embarking on a, a solo. I, I don't even like to call it that. But I like a lot of musicians, I wrote a ton of songs uh, over, you know, from some that quarantine period up until now, they just, songs just kept pouring out. And uh, I'm I'm playing shows and I'm recording with a different group of guys. And uh, this is very much like my own thing that I'm I'm just excited for uh, you know i look everybody always thinks that that what they're whatever they're doing recently is their their best work and i'm never going to write another story of a girl and that's totally cool but uh, i still feel like i have uh something to offer as a writer so i'm excited to get the songs out there that's awesome. What a what a humble and great attitude. And I'll tell you, not many people uh get a story of a girl. They don't. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, it's I'm blessed. Yes, thank you. Very cool. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I love doing it. I really appreciate you having me. Hard to see past the window facing forward looking back. Over years been tracing, wondering how you left your track. Underwater breathing burns your lungs and breaks your back. But you can be waiting right here for Hey, I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with John Hampson. Man. That was a good one. I can't wait to talk about it with Chris in our rap segment, which is coming up after a few words from our sponsors. Hey, this is Chris Santos, host of Delirious Nomads, the Blacklight Media Podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Delirious Nomads is a podcast about all things heavy metal, as well as breakdowns of your favorite combat sports. And me being a chef and all, we'll be riffing on some food talk every week with very special guests from across the globe. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, all you have to do is email your best song via MP3 only and a short bio to band you might not know at gmail.com. This week's featured artist is the Wellingtons, all the way from the wonderful country of Australia. Featuring Zach Anthony on guitar and vocals, Kate Goldsby on bass guitar and vocals, Koji Asano on guitar and vocals, Anna Dobbin on keyboards, and David Kleinjans on the drums. Their latest album is called End of the Summer. 
Here's a snippet of their song, Over and Done With. Chris and Chris. So Chris, I think John was one of the best guests we've ever had. I'm not exaggerating. I love that guy. Well, I, I certainly don't want to hurt any past guests' feelings, but I will say he's he's one of the nicest guests, maybe top three. What a nice yeah. guy. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. Hey, do you know how I originally got to know him, got in touch with him? Have I told you this? Well, no. I mean, I know he was on One Hit Thunder, your other podcast, but I, I didn't know how you hooked up. Well, we did an episode. I think in the first year of doing One Hit Thunder, we did an episode about Absolutely Story of a Girl. And he listened to that episode. And then he went on Twitter and he wrote a series of tweets to us like, hey, listen to the episode. It was great. But here's a couple <laughs> things you got wrong and like corrected us on some little things. Was real nice about it. So then Matt Kelly, uh, who produces One Hit Thunder, he kept in touch with him. And then, yeah, just recently we had him on One Hit Thunder as well. And we're just like, oh, my God, this is the <laughs> this is such a great guy. And, uh, you know. It, it feels good to know that someone you're doing an episode about, I mean, with One Hit Thunder, we never think that the artists are going to listen to the <laughs> to the podcast we're making about them, really. But then on top of that, you know, after we finished the One Hit Thunder episode, I was like, hey, John, I actually produced this podcast. Krista makes a podcast. Next thing you know, he listened to, <laughs> he binged through our catalog and he's on our podcast and Man, when he said those nice things about our show, it really made me feel good. It made me feel good, too, because, you know, it doesn't get much more humble than John. And here, you know, he, he said he always wanted to be an English teacher, uh, yet he had this passion for music. He had this hit. His band goes through the stratosphere. And, you know, at some point, he decides to go back to school, get an English degree, and the woman he wrote this song about ends up being his wife who he decides to start a family with and then he comes back to his music you know so he's he's living the dream he's doing everything he set out to do i mean on top of that his song that is from 23 years ago is now in well chris we actually by the time this is coming out we'll know if it won best picture i believe that everything everywhere all at once should win best picture i've seen like five of the ten nominees but it's one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. And I'm not just saying that. I absolutely love that movie. Uh, but it's like, yeah, it's like a perfect storybook. I'm sure he's had his trials and tribulations as we all have. But I think his story is awesome as hell. I got to tell you, I laughed out loud when he was talking about using the word lover <laughs> in a song. <laughs> you know, like, it's so funny, like, because it is a word that's used a lot in songs, you know, lover. Mm -hmm. But I would never, I would feel so weird saying, oh, this is my lover. <laughs> you know, it's almost like baby, too. I always put baby in songs, but I don't really say baby. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's so, it's so funny to think about that kind of stuff. Yeah, lover, lover's a weird one. If I were to use lover, and I never have, it it would only be in a song. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I think about the Bright Eyes has a song, uh, Lover I Don't Have to Love. That's one of the songs I think. But it is like kind of common in songs to use that word. I, it just, it made me laugh. I was laughing out loud. I mean, I was smiling through this whole thing. Uh, one of the things he was talking about, Chris, I don't know. You probably have experienced this. John was talking about it. I've never been in a position where someone from a record label I was on was putting their two cents in on the actual songwriting. Mm -hmm. Now, on the strategy or like what song's going to be the single or or whatever other things like the business side, yes, but I've never had someone from a record label put their opinion in on the actual writing of the song. Have you experienced that before? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Old yeah. NR guy, yeah, he, he would be in there and he'd be arguing this this bridge part doesn't fit the song. And then you'd have the producer looking over and, you know, sometimes the producer would like give you a wink like, ah, just wait till he leaves. Let's get him out of here and then, then, wow. then, then we'll figure it out. So, yeah, it, it's definitely happened. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, typically the right 
part always prevails. Whatever it's meant to be, uh, you know, the producer, the band, every everyone will figure it out and come to some consensus. But you know, I got to tell you, you know, John mentioned that you know this song only took like twenty minutes to write. It's like stream of consciousness. It was really quick, which we've heard that a lot on this show. You know, uh, your huge hit is written quickly, but uh, the follow up to him writing what he had to go through with the label, John Kalodner, people, you know, arguing about th- this isn't a hit solo in the song. I've never heard such terminology. And then to not only have it used with them, but then he's reading, you know, Steve from Black Crow's book. <laughs> he sees the same quote from John Kalodner, which was hilarious. Hey, well, I really did, Chris, love this story about learning the song with the band for the first time, though. That he's like, I'm not even going to sing it until we have it down. They practice for a few hours. They have it down. And the story, how he told, like, everybody's laughing. And I feel like there's an episode we did before where they talk about how there's so much emotion that if, if it makes you laugh, that's a good thing. And, and he's like, this is just like a pop hit. Like, they, they sounds like they kind of knew it. And how could you not know it if you were playing this song? And it even goes as far as to when he was talking about that moment. Oh, I'm so glad he talked about this and how... He knew at that moment that this was a hit. Was that little, you called it a vocal hiccup. I'd call it like a little stutter. This is the story of a girl. (laughs) That's the moment. Mm -hmm. That thing. You're always talking about the little hooks in the songs, Chris. For some reason, that little pause like makes the song. I can't even explain it. It doesn't even make sense. Something about the syncopation of the music and then that hiccup. It's just awesome. Yeah, I know. I didn't even have a chance to get to it when he talked about it because he knew I was going to talk <laughs> about it because it's just yeah. one of those things. And and you don't know if that was by accident. Maybe he 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 you know had, had was made a mistake when he was doing that particular part of the song, or if it was intentional. In this case, you never know. And and it worked out beautifully. There has to be something about your natural songwriting instincts, Chris. A lot of times you're talking about. We've had so many guests who they were young songwriters when they were writing their song and they don't really know the ins and outs of songwriting yet. And they're just going with their gut. There has to be something about that natural instinct, that gut that appeals to the listener's natural instincts and and their gut feeling mm-hmm. or something. There's some sort of connection there, and it's kind of like magic. Yeah, and definitely for this song, there was a magic there. He, he John explicitly said, this is just verbatim what I was feeling, and it just came out. And, you know, we as human beings, we're, we're all unique, but at the same time, we're, we're more the same than we are different. And if he was feeling those emotions and he was being completely honest and open about it, chances are someone else is going to feel that. And this song resonated with a lot of people. And speaking of resonating with a lot of people, Chris. Oh, yeah? What about resonating with a lot of people? <laughs> Head on over to ChrisToMakes.com. Our VIP program is called The Supporting Cast, where you get bonus episodes each week. Yes, more of Chris and I talking about, I don't know, stuff related to the episode. We'll do countdowns. We'll do polls. We'll just do all kinds of fun stuff. For the price of a cup of coffee, you can get bonus episodes of The After Party. ChrisToMakes.com. It's great, Chris. What can I say? Yeah. We have a lot of fun with The After Party. We have an entire other podcast at ChrisToMakes.com. And everyone, I'm not just saying this. It seems like everyone who comments to us about it says that they love it. And it helps us continue making this podcast. So, you know, if you got enough money to give Chris and I a little a little 5 or $10 tip per month, you know, it's like buying us a beer for making a podcast that you listen to then we will supply you with a bunch of extra episodes plus a giant back catalog of them. Yep, I was going to say, you took the words out of my mouth, Chris. A giant back catalog of episodes, so sign up now. ChrisToMakes.com, we'd appreciate it. And please, give me a follow on Instagram at less than Chris D. I would really like that. want to thank this week's guest, John Hampson, for sitting in with us, and we'll see you next week. Hey, everybody. Satan here. I know what you're thinking. Jesus Christ, Satan has a podcast now too? No, no, that's not it. But I am here to tell you about a podcast, and it's one that's all about my favorite band, Punchline. Not the band you expected me to say, right? You probably figured I'd like Slayer, or maybe some backwards Beatles records or something. Those are okay, but you usually find me rocking out to fan-favorite punchline albums like Action or Lion while I'm torturing dead people for all of eternity.
Punchline's podcast is called A Band Called Punchline, and it's super entertaining to listen to this documentary-style look back at the 25 years of my favorite band. Honestly, I'm really feeling like I'm getting to know these guys, and their story is amazing. I'm so ready for them to get down here. I have so many questions. I gotta give them credit for catching on to my whole 37 thing, too. There's a reason why they're my favorite band, and if you listen to their podcast, they might become yours, too. A band called Punchline is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Check it out, and I'll see you all in hell. Hey, this is Mike Wiebe, and I'm the singer in a band called The Riverboat Gamblers. And I'm Zach Blair. I play guitar in a band called Rise Against. Mike and I also have a band called The Draculas, and we also have this great, amazing new podcast called Zach and Mike Make Three. Yeah, each week we're going to ask ourselves and we're going to ask our guests what three favorite things they are into at that moment or in their entire lives. And then we're either going to agree with them or we're going to make fun of them. And uh, you're going to listen to it and you're going to like it or we will make fun of you. How about that? I just flipped it on you, the person listening to this right now. But we're going to do it every week here on the Sound Talent Network. Once again, it's called Zach and Mike Make Three. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hey there, I am Johnny Christ from Avenge Sevenfold, and I've got a podcast called Drinks with Johnny you're going to want to check out. I sit down with a bunch of different people from all different walks of life, from professional wrestlers to actors, comedians, fighters, musicians, everything in between. I'm just looking to make some friends and have a good time doing it. So if that sounds like something you're into, go check out Drinks with Johnny, streaming everywhere now.